Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another On The Time Lash Extra. Are we Mark and I? Hello, I'm Ben. Hello, Mark. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, and this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, Under The Lake and Before The Flood by Toby Whithouse. Um, originally, this was going to go out as two parts, uh, which I think is what we'll do in future anyway. Rather yeah, than record so. one after each episode, we will just record after each story um, because a lot of these are going to be two parts. And frankly, uh, a lot of the thoughts that I had uh, f about Under the Lake, uh, they they they've changed now that I have seen part two of uh, of this story. I, I don't know about you, Mark. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I watched uh, Before the Flood on Sunday, but I watched... Under the Lake again, just so we kind of did it as like a two-parter in one yes. in one sitting, and it works really well together. So yeah, I think it, it it's quite good to do this discussion of the story as a discussion of you know the full thing rather than because you know me if you if you listen to the podcast regularly, I've kind of taken against this kind of rampant speculation that which you know don't get me wrong is part of the fun of being a Doctor Who fan, but yeah. I think. You know, that's fine when you're talking about it with your friends in the pub, but you don't want to sort of package this sort of rampant speculation that comes to nothing as as something to listen to, because then you can't really listen to it after the fact, because you know everything that we've said is wrong. <laughs> so, well, yes, exactly. So it'll be nice to do this as kind of like as a one -er. Yeah, I'm perfectly aware of the, uh, shall we say, ephemeral nature, the transient nature of podcasts. Yes. <laughs> uh, but we don't want the, we don't want to make them more disposable than they already are. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so with so, that in so mind, yes. shall we talk about the Doctor Who news from a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> <laughs> yes, shall we? Yes. Okay, so the two main bits of news are that there is now, or there is going to be, a, a new Doctor Who spin-off, um, but also the War Doctor is coming to big finish. Uh, okay, you decide, Mark, which one do you want to which one do you want to chew over first? Uh, well, should we do class first? <clears throat> yes, let's do it. Class. Class. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why I'm singing the Green Show <laughs> tune, but uh, it, it seemed appropriate. Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah. Class, the new uh, yeah. Doctor Who spin-off by the young adult. Well, he's not a young adult, but he writes young yeah. adult fiction, Patrick Ness. Um, which you know, it's it's good that Doctor Who is getting a spin-off. It shows that it's still a very valuable property for the BBC, despite what some people will have you believe. Yeah. Um, in terms of ratings and stuff like that. And I mean, yeah, fine. You know, it's not it's not directed at us, but I would argue that neither's Doctor Who. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? We'll all be watching the first episode, like you know, if we like it or not. That's up to us. Um, but... Look, I like I hated Torchwood, but I watched every yeah. episode of it. It's not just going to be a case of the first episode. I'm gonna, you know, I, I didn't hate Sarah Jane Adventures, and I did watch every episode, but it, it, you know, there was just something that it was. It wasn't for me, but I was loyal. I was yeah. loyal. So, you know, class, I'm going to be watching it. Well, that's the thing. I mean, the Sarah J Jane Adventures was absolutely not for me, but I absolutely adored it. Uh, it's, uh, I was such a huge fan of, of that program. Well, it was uh, it was nearer to the, the the vibe and the instincts of the parent series than Torchwood was. I, mean, I suppose that is important to remember: is that uh, we now have uh, we now have a spin off from this era of Doctor Who. Uh, the last time that happened, when Torchwood and Sarah Jane did make their appearance, it was at the uh, the, the the absolute height, the fervor. Of new Doctor Who, oh, so yeah, total I peak think of, peak of the power uh, stuff, wasn't it? Yeah. it was... So I think we can take uh, the commissioning of class as an indicator that Doctor Who, as as you said, is not in the is not in the decline, the free fall that a lot of people uh, either believe or want to make out that it is. Uh, it's actually in very considerable rude health. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the thing is, I mean, the, you say what you like about the ratings. I mean, the, you know, there's no way around it. They are down. They are, you know. The, Sure, but, but not like in this a, a, a little bit. Yeah, exactly. By a little no, bit. No, they're down a little bit, as you kind of imagine uh, a show would be after what nearly eleven years on the air. It's become a show that you know is is very well loved, very well respected by the, the BBC. We're Thirty years on from the hiatus, let's just take a moment to just appreciate that that it is still something that, that yeah. they value. Granted, it could be on earlier on a Saturday. I think 
it runs the risk of not earning that new family audience. I mean, yeah. you know, existing families that have watched Doctor Who, say, since Matt Smith when it was on around 7 o'clock, they are still watching it on iPlayer or, mm-hmm. you know, the kids are staying up late or whatever. But I think children that have grown into the age of, you know, getting into Doctor Who, I wonder if showing it at half past 8, 20 to 9 in the, in, in the evening on a Saturday is running a risk somehow of kind of excluding that new audience? There's a thing it might be uh, a good idea to put out to our listenership. Uh, if you're listening and you're a parent, uh, how about getting in contact with us and uh, and, and kind of talking over the... Or g- give us your views on this very idea. Um, do you think that the fact that uh, Doctor Who, uh, a little bit of each episode now falls beyond the watershed, nine o'clock, uh, is your experience that it is detrimental to the family getting together and watching. Yeah, so I, I can't really source the answer for that. Uh, let the kids stay up. Um, I don't have kids, you don't have Mark, and I, and I, and I don't actually know anybody who does have kids. Um, I know people that have kids, but none of them are obviously of the age uh, to be watching Doctor Who as yet. They're all sort of babies or toddlers and things like that. Um, what we kind of forget, and I think the the response to class kind of highlighted this, is that we Doctor Who fans, you know, who you know who have been fans for 50, 40, 30, 20, whatever years, you know, we kind of forget the fact that, that it's not really about us in terms of things. And I think when you're in that kind of Twitter bubble, you're in that kind of message board bubble, you kind of forget that there's actually people who are watching it and enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually people growing up watching Doctor Who and getting in, you yeah. know, getting into it. And I think, and with the class announcement, there was a lot of kind of ill, ill feeling towards it. And I, at first, I was like, well, that's a bit of a letdown. Well, the ill feeling was because hashtag the big announcement pointed at something significantly different. Uh, you know, we thought, were well, we going to get new episodes back? Was there going to be, uh, sorry, uh, going to be some missing episodes back? Was there going to be uh, an announcement about this rumour that there might not be a full series next year? Uh, what, what, what was happening? Was there going to be a Doctor Who uh, f- a feature film, a motion picture? What was going to, no, we're getting a... We're getting a young adult spin-off. On BBC Three. Yeah. Uh, and quite rightly, not quite rightly, actually, um, but quite rightly, a lot of people went, oh, Understandably? Understandably, yes. Uh, a lot of people said, oh, I don't give a fuck. I don't. What? Yeah. Oh, no. What? Uh, this isn't for me. I don't care. You know. Um, I, th- I think that was just the BBC pr- uh, press office and brand office yeah. misjudging spectacularly uh, the uh, the priorities of online Doctor Who fandom. Yes, definitely, definitely. It's a positive announcement. Uh, we'll all be watching. Let's not beat around the bush. Yeah. And also what I want to highlight as well is that Ian Levine, amongst others, is kind of saying, well, is this why we're not getting a full series next year? It's like, well, first of all, nobody's announced that. Second of all, that the series Jane Adventures in Torchwood never stopped us having a full series of Doctor Who. Yeah. Ever. Even Moffat will be executive producer, but he yeah. is not writing any episodes, and nor is no. he creator of it as well. It's uh, No, it, indeed. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, well, I'm going to... I will be watching it, as I said. Uh, there's internet speculation. Maybe we will see a return of Ian Chesterton, which would be, be absolutely fantastic. But I think I, I think you said on our, our original recording, you know, isn't it kind of wonderful that that this sort of new young adult, trendy spin-off of Doctor Who, is set in an institution a, 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 in a school that was there right at the very beginning of the show? Oh yeah 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 yeah. It's, so it, it's such a lovely little touch. Cole Hill School. Uh, that's the, the that's the very first uh, environment we see in Doctor Who in 1963, mm-hmm. and, uh, and now 53, 52 years later, uh, it's the site of a spin-off. That's uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Yep. That's the BBC. Maybe. That's that's the BBC. <laughs> uh, the other bit of news is uh, hot on the heels of Big Finish uh, making Torchwood spin-offs and inheriting characters and monsters from the the new series, like the Jadoon and Professor River Song. Uh, they're also now Big Finish uh, working with. John Hurt, Sir John Hurt, as the War Doctor. There's going to be a box, a couple of box sets of uh, of Time War stories. Of the time War, and I think, I mean, I I think audio is the perfect the perfect home for the Time War. Really. Yeah, 
because you know everybody says oh you know you could do a feature film some of the some of the stuff that Russell T Davies wrote into those first sort of Eccleston and Tennant series conjures up this like wonderful grand imagery that I, even a feature film I think would struggle to yeah to realize on screen so I mean audio you've kind of you can kind of just build on that and kind of make you know play to people's imaginations um, it's going to be very noisy I think yeah <laughs> it's going to be quite tricky to kind of I kind of get your head around I think uh, for some of it but I think you know we're going to have like quite an exciting sort of wartime political thriller uh, with with John Hurt as as the war doctor. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, well not just John Hurt because so I believe there's going to be four box sets, three of them with John Hurt and one of them with uh, Paul McGann's eighth mm-hmm. Doctor, in the lead up to uh, to the to the Time War. So yes. basic basically something that's immediately before the Night of the Doctor. Yeah, so um, we'll, we will have our sort of, much like they've done recently with the Sixth Doctor, mm-hmm. I guess what that Eighth Doctor box set will do will give us our end point for the Eighth Doctor, but they can still kind of play around. Yeah. In, in Fill the in their own continuity. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's very exciting, very very exciting. It's. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I just. I just think. Uh, I just think it's absolutely fantastic that that big finish uh, that was that was this kind of this bastion, this this little um, this little island of Doctor Who, which was one of the, the the main supporting pillars to keep fandom alive in those wilderness years, is now being rewarded by. I mean, essentially being canon now, essentially being an official wing of BBC television yeah. Doctor Who. Um, and, and I think that's something, you know, you've got to thank Stephen Moffat for. Absolutely, he is, yeah. He, I mean, as much as Russell T. Davis is a big supporter, a big finish, and, and somebody who's kind of, who protected them during that kind of early period where Doctor Who was this massive marketing force again. And they were like, well, what do we do about this, these sort of audios? And Russell T. said, oh, no, don't worry, we'll, we'll look after that. Stephen Moffat, more than that, has written <laughs> Big Finish into canon can- television Doctor Who. So it's all yeah. the same thing. Yeah. How, which is which is great, which is really great. Yeah, uh, it and is. That's going to continue with with new adventures for the, the War Doctor and allegedly, it's still not being confirmed yet, uh, new adventures for for the 10th Doctor and Donna. Ah, yeah. Now, you mentioned this uh, in the in the last attempt Indeed. at this podcast. Uh, I've not heard this, but you're saying there are rumours. There, is, there are rumours, the... yeah, that have been circulated by Blog to Who. They've right. not been sort of confirmed by anybody else. Uh, there was a slightly sniffy, slightly uh, <laughs> ill-tempered uh, post by Kasturberis. So they wrote this thing about how it was, you know, it's all a big secret by Big Finish, and and now that Blogger who spilled the beans, David Tennant and Catherine Tate awoke to reporters on their doorstep, and you know, and all this kind of, they're not okay. able to live their lives privately. I don't think the 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 British press are all that interested in a, in licensed audio dramas yeah. <laughs> based on the television series Doctor Who yeah. that they will be doorstepping actors. <laughs> It's just such a fucking ridiculous image. Yeah. David, David, what do, you, what do you say to the allegations that uh, you'll be making some new Doctor Who purely on audio for people that are, are only really interested, who are really, really strongly interested in Doctor Who? They'll be setting that gap before the unicorn and the wasp. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a quote, David. <laughs> you... <laughs> anyway, right, okay. Uh, shall we? Uh, the, the, it, uh, we, you know, we wait with bated breath. Indeed. indeed. Um, shall we? Shall we get on to the proper meat and drink of this let's, podcast? Then? Let's do. Let's do. Uh, this, I'm sure you have your. Uh, everybody listening has their own views on class and on the War Doctor, uh, but you're wanting to hear what we think of uh, of the of the recent episodes from season nine. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, it is really a game of two halves, isn't it? Isn't it? It's uh, I okay. I will start. I will start by saying that um, on the face of it, I really enjoyed this story for the meta quality that uh, that it seemed to exhibit. You had a part one that was absolute cast iron, traditional, very familiar safe Doctor Who mm-hmm. base under siege, told in a very linear manner with uh, scary monsters and thrills and chills. And then you have a second episode uh, which 
which does something that has never ever been done in Doctor Who before at all. Uh, uh, set all over the shop, it's not linear. It's um, it's all about about the very nature of time travel itself and what you can do and what you can't do and. Uh, and uh, you know, on that front, it's a, I, I really enjoy the fact that part one was very much about kind of doing something in the traditional mould of, of you know classic Doctor Who sixty three to, to eighty nine, and then the second episode was was about going well. This is what new Who does now. This this the, these two episodes side by side are the difference between classic Who and new Who. Um, so I really take my hat off to it. I think uh, I, I really enjoyed it on that front. Having said that. Uh, I think maybe having seen the second part now, the story falls possibly too far on the wrong side of uh, convoluted rather mm. than intriguing. Um, I, I don't know. How, how do you how do you feel about it? I mean, I, I really like uh, what you're saying there. That it, it's it's kind of this sort of. Uh... Part one is classic Doctor Who. Part two is what new Doctor Who does, and you sort of use this story as an example yeah. of, of how far we've come. That's a really nice way of looking at it. Um, I, I pretty much agree with you. I mean, I I came away from Under the Lake feeling a little bit. I mean, I watched the episode. I enjoyed the episode, but then sure. that kind of thing of going online and sort of seeing the online response to it, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, that was excellent! That was amazing!" Uh, and I was like, "Really? It was to me. It was just playing it very safe, just very traditional. You know, it was Doctor Who in, in big letters, big bold letters. This is this is what Doctor Who does. You know, mm-hmm. Doctor Who one hundred and one. And I started to think that you know, the Doctor Who stories that that always seem to receive." sort of the great deal of praise at the moment in this sort of Stephen Moffat era are the ones that feel like the Doctor Who people grew up with. Because there's always yeah. been a base, you know, there's always been a base, under, no matter how old you are, or what Doctor was your Doctor, what Doctor you know you grew up with, there's always been a story similar to Under the Lake. You know, for yeah. younger fans, it's something like The Impossible Planet and the Satan Pit. Mm-hmm. You know, uh <clears throat> Or so, 42, something yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. just and so on and so on. And it goes, you know, right the way back to the, I guess, the Tenth Planet being the sort of the first of these kind of these kind of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so I kind of was like, well, it's not doing anything particularly new or exciting. or I mean, it's yeah. very atmospheric. It's very well done. It's got a cracking cliffhanger. Yeah. Um, but I just kind of felt, yeah, well, that's Doctor Who. It's nothing yeah. to kind of shout from the rooftops it's just yeah fine that's that's what i like about doctor who um wasn't that fun yeah yeah and then like you say part two is something completely different opening with such a an attention grabbing uh pre-titles which i i adored uh, yeah. I, know, I know there's, you know, in the history of Doctor Who, the Doctor talking directly to camera doesn't always go down uh, particularly well. I'm looking at you, Tom Baker. Um, <laughs> but it's it was just a, a sort of real masterful performance from, from Peter Capaldi as, mm-hmm. as the Doctor. Uh, and was he talking to us? Was he talking to um, the, the two characters in the TARDIS? Who knows? Doesn't matter. Uh, it yeah. kind of sets out its stall for how he's going to get out of that cliffhanger, uh, which is a, like a really nice and fresh kind of way to to build on on what was a really exciting cliffhanger is to then kind of have a lecture from the Doctor as to how he'll probably get out of it, which becomes clearer then as the episode ends and sort of picks up yeah. that that speech again. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I would say though that that scene at the start of the the second part is the prime example of it being too convoluted. Mm. He needs to have a, a ser- essentially a little, um, the Doctor giving a little disclaimer at the start of the episode. Ra- rather than that, some- rather than that something that organically grow out of the uh, episode two's narrative, and then there'd be like a kind of, as there was a kind of, in the TARDIS, a little final kind of um, debate at the at the end, maybe that I mean, they have I, to actually say, "Look, what this yeah. is very complicated. Watch out for this. This is what's going to happen." Because you know, because essentially what it was was uh, it was a narrative that was engineered backwards, um, but everything was so 
there, there, there was there was so much vying for attention, and uh, there was there was so much kind of individual little plot strands that uh, that, that that needed analysing and bringing together that it did come across as very jumbled and very messy by the uh, by the end yeah. of it. Um, well, it, it, it's so kind of complex um, that I hadn't even registered the fact. The character that Paul Kay plays is of the same species that, the, that David Williams played in The God Complex. I didn't twig that last week, and I twigged it about, I think, the sort of first scene between between the Doctor and, and him, and I was like, oh, right, yeah! <laughs> that yeah, species, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> of course it was. Um, so yeah, there's so much vying for your attention that these little nods to the past just completely. Yeah, went over I, I my did head. like that because I mean usually you'll get it'll be the showrunner that brings back one of their particular monsters or creations. It was nice to see the Toby Whithouse as a you know he's he's very familiar with us, but um, you know he is he is just a guest writer and that he's bringing back one of the creations. Uh, that uh, that is featured in the God Complex. I so I I love that. And yeah, and there was other things as well. You know, like, uh, mentions of Mister Saxon and Rose and Martha, and uh, the intriguing mention of the Minister of War. Indeed, indeed. What could that, that possibly uh, mean? Uh, probably, probably exactly nothing. <laughs> That's uh, well, possibly, possibly. But then yeah. you know, possibly it means something. I like to think that that's Moffat's reaction to to Russell T Davis. I, you know, Russell T Davis's stories will have a very distinct uh, mention of something in episodes that will lead up to the big bad at the end of the series. Well, uh, I hope hopefully they just go the Minister of War, and then it will be never mentioned again. <laughs> it won't, won't like that. Then. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm people, waiting people... on the massive fucking strop that's going to happen on Saturday when it turns out Maisie Williams yeah. is playing a new character, because it's yeah. going to be it's going to be a cacophony of <laughs> it's gonna, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you promised us they did nothing they of the absolutely sort. Absolutely did not. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, but yeah. this week. I, I, I do I do want to justify what I've said about convolution is that uh, I know we've had discussions about people uh, complaining that it's uh, you know it's too complicated <laughs> and I don't have a problem with complicated stories uh, I've I you know something like the time of the doctor I like a lot found it fairly easy to follow it was even even at the height of Christmas where you're stuffed and drunk on this on the on the the couch uh but this i kind of felt like there were just one too many elements that uh that kind of required an awful lot of scenes within these two parts of the doctor uh being the exposition mm. rather than the character uh that's not to say mm. you know i didn't like it i very much did I thought the cast of characters, the the additional characters, were great. It's a shame Jenna Coleman didn't have much to do. No, but what she does have to do is, I think, quite interesting, and I think it's it's going to continue on throughout this series, which is this kind of study of grief, yeah, and addiction as a kind of escape from your circumstances. You have that scene, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which is certainly my favourite scene in it, uh, Under the Lake, where the Doctor says, look, we all like to have a nice adventure and stuff like that, but, you know, I'm the only one here who is allowed to kind of be the kind of the dangerous, reckless one, and you have to remember the fact that, you know, you've still got a life. And then yeah. that scene in the TARDIS where she realises he's going to die, and she tells him, and she wants him to to change history to save himself because she doesn't want to be left alone that's that's a really interesting direction they're going in with the character is that she feels abandoned yeah. by Danny presumably well obviously uh, and and doesn't want to then have the doctor and the TARDIS stripped away from her as well and leave her with nothing yeah and yeah. that's that's quite a sort of weighty adult topic to deal with um, and that's presumably what's going to going to feed into her uh, departure. Hopefully, it will be a happy ending rather than a kind of a, a darker one. But those those kind of you know, addiction as a as a form of dealing with grief stories never tend to end very well in 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 fiction, and in real life. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see with that. But I mean, like you say, yeah, there's a lot of kind of running around. Yeah, a little bit of exposition for her. But in those sort of two scenes, she's great. Um, in the two scenes where she does actually have something a bit more interesting to do. You know, it's not just Jenna Coleman. I hated the moment that. Uh... Marvin Christie's character uh, was it O'Donnell? O'Donnell, yeah. 
died because I thought, yeah, no, uh, I'd like her to be the new companion, please. O'Donnell and Bennett. I mean, Bennett was slightly watery, but O'Donnell and Bennett as the new companions would have been, I'd love that. That scene between the Doctor and Bennett after um, O'Donnell's killed, I I loved. I thought it was, was fantastic. Two really great performances. Mm-hmm. Um, that I was kind of like, you know, you know I was like, God, wouldn't it be great if it was just like the Doctor and Bennett and the TARDIS as these two kind of prickly scientists who, you know, have a, respect each other but are still a bit unsure of each other. But that's never yeah. going to happen. You're not going <laughs> to. Well, that that was the uh, that was the intrigue of that in that it was it, you know now that we know that Clara's leaving, it's nice to look at the Doctor. Um, relating to other characters that are not uh, a Clara or Rose or Martha-esque character Mm -hmm. and to imagine what the series would be like if, say, it was two guys in the TARDIS. Um, You know, both of them scientists, one an extrovert, one an introvert. That was uh, was great. But with with O'Donnell, I mean, uh, when they first came out the TARDIS, uh, and she says, oh, I've just got something in my shoe. Can you walk on? And then she, like, not to the doctor, squeals to Bennett that it's bigger on the inside. I love that. Yes. Uh, oh, she was that, a great that, that, that felt like a real, uh, yeah. I mean, that felt like a real Ian and Barbara moment. Yeah, it did. You know, going, it? going going right back to like the the, the, the original run of, of shows in the sixties. Uh, how each reaction was between Ian and Barbara. They talked it out themselves rather than relate to the Doctor. It was all about what the uh, what the companions and therefore the audience would have experienced. I, I really enjoyed. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. It was a great shame that she died. Yeah. Really, really did not it's like it. I thought funny, they were going to bring her back at the end. Uh, well, um, I thought that. I, I did, first of all, th- think that um, by the Doctor sort of fixing everything, it would then mean that those that died didn't actually die because he'd stopped, mm-hmm. he'd stopped the creature in the past. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But clearly not. Um, but also what I thought, <laughs> I think Stephen Moffat, uh, I mean, obviously he didn't write this one, but still, there seems to be a trend in, in sort of Moffat-era Doctor Who now where anybody that sort of uh, claims to be a fan of the Doctor is uh, routinely dispatched. Yes. <laughs> we've had Osgood <laughs> killed off, and now we've had O'Donnell yeah. killed off. It's as if he's trying to tell us something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so we, we talked about the characters, we talked about the kind of the feel of the episode. Uh, what we have now is, a, is uh, an introduction of, so we had our, our ghost monsters in, uh, in Under the Lake, and now we have, a, for this episode, we have a kind of controlling new monster, uh, the Fisher King. Um, uh, so it was provided by, is it the lead singer of, of Slipknot? Well, it's kind of, it was basically a threefold performance, wasn't it? So okay. you had... Um, Peter Serafinowicz, who I love very much, a great sort of comic actor yeah. uh, and performer, uh, as the voice of the Fisher King. Right, okay. You had uh, the lead singer of Slipknot as the roar of the Fisher King. Okay, and right. And then you had the UK's tallest man as the body of the Fisher King. Right, okay. <laughs> okay. And together I think it made quite a memorable uh, creation, really. Uh, I don't know if I agree. No. Uh, and it's interesting that you say Peter Serafinovich there, uh, because the voice sounded very Darth Molly. Uh, <laughs> well, that would be why. Uh, it did. But also, it looked... I know that there are a series of films, Alien vs. Predator, but <laughs> the monster looked like a com- like a, a composite of those two iconic sci-fi uh, creatures. Right, yeah. yeah, a little bit, yeah. Little and bit. It, it kind of ended up looking... Scary, certainly, uh, effective, but not very original, not very memorable. Mm-hmm. Which, which we've we, we've talked about before is that there seems there seems like there's a lack of particularly original, iconic monsters that uh, that come out of the new series. I mean, I quite like the design, um, and I quite like the sort of. I mean, I think it would be... I mean, we never will because the budget, you know, just doesn't cover it. But I thought it would be quite interesting to kind of see a bit more of these of these creatures, personally. I mean, I do kind of... It's a shame that Doctor Who's a family show and that Peter Capaldi is not playing Malcolm Tucker. Because mm-hmm. I can only imagine that uh, the Fisher King would have been called Fanny Face or uh, <laughs> Cunt Features or something throughout yeah. the course of the... Because that was quite a distracting uh, design 
on the uh, on the mouth of the creature there, yeah. which again ties back to that sort of predator thing that you were talking about. But I mean, I I quite like the design. Um, well, yeah, I'm not saying that I didn't. I just uh, but I do agree I that perhaps it's a little underwhelming. Perhaps and maybe that comes down to the fact that it's one creature that's kind of it's it's sort of uh, what's the, its motives are really to just bring along his mates and invade the planet as per yeah. usual. Well, yeah, you're yeah. right. You know, maybe that's that's why it's not got anything particularly unique about its its motives or its you yeah. know it's just got a gun. It doesn't have like a cool imaginative way of killing people or anything like that. Its most imaginative thing is that thing where it kind of rips out the soul of a, which is a terrifying idea. To, you know, it rips out the soul of a, a living creature and uses it to kind of as a sort of broadcasting uh, yeah. service. That's a, that's quite a horrible idea, but it's maybe not hammered home. Well, enough. it is. I mean, particularly. Well, I, it is. It is the case of the the action isn't, but but the the fact that the ghosts still remain at the end, and that they have to be sealed off in a room, which unit will then come and get and blast into space. Yeah, uh, is absolutely horrifying. They, it's yeah. it's not the, it's not the usual kind of clean wrap up of an ending where oh the ghosts they just fade away because yeah. their purpose is no longer <laughs> yeah. is it, they're, they're, no, they're not longer needed anymore but the fact that they'll remain mm-hmm. uh, and eventually they'll kind of dim out but we're not told over what kind of time frame so yeah. you know that, oh that, that's that's a, that, like a real a real living death. Uh, yeah, exactly. More so than you know something like Death in Heaven, where you know the, you're put inside a Cyberman. This is like a, a proper kind of yeah. It is quite a horrifying idea, and it, it's yeah. so it kind of gives the Doctor that kind of great sort of anger, that sort of righteous anger that you get from the Doctor every now and again. Yeah. And Capaldi sells it so well in that sort of final confrontation. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. This this here is where your story ends. Oh, yeah, in retrospect, in retrospect, he's really good at that uh, in that scene. Uh, yeah. And I say in retrospect because when I was watching it, when when there's that confrontation where he's standing beside the uh, the white casket and he's mm-hmm. having the face off with the uh, with the Fisher King, um, he seems he seems distracted. And I thought maybe we've come to this point where we get a bit of a poor performance from Capaldi. But what it is, as we find out at the end of the episode, is that's the point of realisation. Yeah. Where he's got to essentially manipulate everything. Uh, you know, essentially work the narrative backwards, as he said. Like yeah. That's the point that he realises that if he's, if he's very careful and manipulative, he can get out of this alive and he can have his cake and eat it. Yeah. Um, so he's doing the calculations while having the face off as well. So I, uh, I, I did, I, 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 in retrospect, I really liked that scene. Yeah, it's, it's great because, you know, you've got that kind of pacing around and that kind of, he looks almost cowardly, but when you actually, when once the episode's wrapped up, you're like, he's actually sort of plotting to kill the creature, get inside the thing. And wake yeah. up in the in the underwater base in a hundred yeah. years' time. But I mean, the moment you saw that thing in episode one, a hundred percent, you knew the Doctor was inside of that. It yeah, was... yeah, yeah, definitely, <laughs> like... definitely. Well, because there's that bit, isn't there, where the, the the sort of countdowns going down on the, in the in the future uh, on the thing while Clara and um, the rest of the crew are being menaced by the ghosts, and the Doctor is kind of facing off against the Fisher King, and and you know he's going to die. So you're like, oh no, the Fisher King's going to wake up. And they go, wait a minute, no he's not. That's how the Doctor's going to get out of it, isn't he? He's going to get in mm-hmm. that and then he'll wake up <laughs> in the future and everything will be fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah. But no, it was, it was good. I I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the second part and I, I think it's kind of... It, I certainly rethought a lot of my opinions about the first part. Actually, even on second viewing, but then once it, the story had sort of wrapped itself up, I was like, oh no, actually that's quite a quite an interesting Doctor Who story it's kind of it's what a two-parter I think should be it should have a kind of grand scale but then you know the second part should feel different should feel like a continuation of the story in a different direction Mm -hmm. Um, oh absolutely and I mean as I said something that we've because we've talked about this before that for a show about time travel there's actually very few stories within the body of Doctor Who work which are directly about time travel yeah Sure. Uh, you know, or, or the, the the kind of the the implications of or what can or can't be done. And this within within that small group of stories, this is unique in that it's the first time, possibly maybe episode one of the Space Museum, but it's that first time 
which is uh, you, you get a story all about how if how do things actually happen if you yeah. go back and, 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 and change them. The bootstrap uh, paradox. Yes, is that? Oh, I love that bit as well. I love that. You know, like uh, we're now at an age where certain things don't even have to be uh, within the fiction explained. Uh, you know, like the character kind of just knowingly says, "Google it." Yeah. People will will go and do that right there and then. They'll pause the story, do it there and then, yeah. and then they'll be, "Oh yeah, okay, I get it." Like I I, I just love that. It was. The, the the fact that you can now have such economy in storytelling, yeah. because you know that there are probably people who are watching it will have a little device sitting next to them that will allow them instantaneous access. Yeah, it does. It does play up to that. To, I mean, I I don't. Doctor Who's one of the few television programs yeah. that I don't do this during. But you know, there is people that that watch television programs while checking their emails or while checking Twitter. So yeah, it's quite fun to kind of play to that audience. <laughs> I go Google it. Okay, I will. While you're playing the title sequence, I'll Google the bootstrap. But then, I, I, like, I do think it's funny that I mean, from day one of Doctor Who in the in the sixties, there has been an educational aspect that's kind of run through Doctor Who, yeah. and uh, that is the uh, the perfect epitome of the modern version of it, which is it's still educational, <laughs> yes. but uh, on your own time, go and uh, go and do some research on yeah. the internet. Google it. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than we do six episodes dealing with, I don't know, the Romans or the Vikings or something like that, we will just say the words, Google it, you will have all the information you need and we can cut this bad boy down to two episodes. That, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a, a, a good place to end it. Well, I think Vikings, you know, leads us very neatly into next uh, to next time. So, yeah, maybe yeah. we should uh, just wrap it up, wrap it up there. Which makes it look like it's going to be a bit of a comedy romp, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if that will be the case or not. I mean, if it's a comedy romp called The girl who died then you know that's what well i mean that yeah that's one of the reasons they i mean they they, they make it look like it's going to be carry on vikings yes uh in, in the trailer but it's there's a, there's a fairly sinister tone to the actual episode titles of the next two the next Indeed. two stories so yeah I'm, I'm quite interested to see like i say I, I look forward to the massive strop the internet throws when it turns out Maisie williams is playing a new character yeah well uh, i mean we, do, we don't fun. know we we don't know we, don't uh, know we certainly don't know how she will affect us in this episode, uh, or yes. sorry, in, the, in the, the upcoming episode for you know, and to how we will feel seeing her again, or or whatever happens. Yes. There's, like this, we said this at the start. There is no use speculating. Exactly. Um, uh, we just wait a couple of days and then enjoy <laughs> it or not, but you know, enjoy exactly. it. Um, all right. Well, I mean, we'll do performances and scenes yeah. and all that kind of thing. Uh, do, you, do you want to do that, or should we just wait until we properly get into this oh, story? Well, we might as well do. Are we? Are we not? I mean, yeah. to be honest, I, I I thought most of the supporting, in fact, if not all the supporting cast were all fantastic. Yeah. Especially sort of Morvan Christie as uh, O'Donnell, such a gr- a great character. It's a shame to be cut down in her prime. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, also cut down in the prime is uh, the distinctive voice of Colin McFarlane. Well, uh, exactly. Who was dispatched wide in the opening in the opening sequence yeah. of of the first part. Uh, the velvety tones of uh, Colin McFarlane yeah, completely. And- uh, denied to us yeah but you know like uh, it was a great cast it was from very uh i think probably probably the the the, the ghosts more than the fisher king himself effective monsters yeah, um sure. uh I, I, I don't know it just, i don't know possibly it could have been three parts i just i just feel like maybe there was uh mm. there was a few more significant I think you'd bits be pushing of... it i think you'd be pushing it at three but i mean it's uh it's a very good story i mean i again actually in terms of if we're going to do sort of favorites and stuff like that mm-hmm. um favorite scenes like i've already discussed um would be the, the clara dot scene in the tardis but actually in before the flood aside from the doctor's sort of confrontation with the fisher king i thought that scene in which colin mcfarlane is chasing after Cass yeah with an axe and just dragging this axe along the floor yeah. was fucking terrifying for like oh, you know absolutely. if you're watching that as a kid that's yeah. so tense yeah and it's an axe as well it's you know there's no messing about that's a proper fucking weapon that will split your skull in two um that was yeah properly evocative you can see why the back end of each episode is now on after nine o'clock. Yeah. It's, it's it's not tea time horror for tots. What what's 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 the phrase tea time terror for tots? It's proper nighttime terror for fucking anybody. You know it's uh... <laughs> yeah. Much like uh, who wrote the works of Beethoven. I wonder what came first, the time the time slot or writing to the time yes. slot. Yes. 
Who, we'll never know. We'll never know. Yeah. Well, you know. Okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll monitor that. And again, if uh, if you're listening and you're a parent and you want to give us your uh, opinions on the uh, the kind of later time slot uh, of Doctor Who, how that affects your viewing and your family's viewing, we'd be genuinely very interested to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, Twitter or Facebook, or you can email us at on the time lash at outlook dot com. Um, so our next episode out will be it'll be the normal podcast, won't it? It'll be the normal. Yes, it'll be our look at uh, robots and death and uh, planet views. Yes. I've got that the wrong way around, but you know, <laughs> the, those two yes. stories. And we'll be back with the, another on the time lash extra uh, in two weeks after the next uh, two episodes, the next two parter. Yeah, so we've got the the girl who died and the woman who yeah. lived. So we'll discuss those in another little uh, bonus podcast uh, the week after yes. that. Uh, and so you can get us on iTunes, you can listen to us and download us via our website, and you can now, uh, thanks to you, Mark, you can now uh, stream us on YouTube with some little extra... Yep, yeah, they're all streaming on YouTube as well, if you, you know, if you, if you don't have the ability to download uh, the podcast, yes. you, can, you can stream it as well. From your workplace computer, not that I condone that. Sort of thing. <laughs> oh, here's here's just one because I, I know I I texted you this already, but um, uh, for listeners, oh. uh, so I uh, I've this is a lovely thing to end. Yeah, on. I've uh, I've moved to London now, and and, and I'm going to I think I'll, I'll probably say this now. I'm going to because um, you have your feature on the website, which is kind of I mean it's largely stalled now, but you're a doctor you're on the Time Lash book club uh, and various reviews that you do of, of Big Finish. Uh, I'm going to to start a feature called uh, The Doctor's Guide to um, in this case London because I've moved to London and it's the place is so vast I want to get to know the city but I don't really know where to begin uh, until the other day I thought I'll I'll let Doctor Who be my guide. I will uh, I, I will use Doctor Who and its locations within London as a place to begin my uh, you know my my getting to know the city of London. Uh, and this was prompted by the fact that I live in Ealing now, and about ten minutes down the end of my street is the uh, it's now a Marks and Spencers, but it was the department store that in 1970 the Autons shatter the windows of to gun down people waiting at a bus stop and spearhead from space. Did you? Was there a blue plaque erected to commemorate this, or did you find that via the Alas, internet? Alas, there is not. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, I know that Doctor Who and uh, particularly Ealing Studios uh, have a bit of a history, uh, but I, I went on the Doctor Who locations guide, and uh, um, yeah, it's this, it's this area. And the intriguing, the intriguing thing is that the window that the Autons—I mean, you never see the Autons coming out, but the um, of the window. No, you don't. Do you? It's that sort of psycho thing, isn't yes. it? Where you think you've seen the window breaking, but you've not actually yeah. seen the window what, breaking. What you see is the the Autons moving, and then it cuts to a policeman talking to uh, I guess like a road sweeper or a builder or something uh, at, so, having yeah. a cup of tea you hear the shatter of glass and then it cuts to autons walking across the street shooting people so yes you don't actually see the window breaking but the window that you see them actually moving about in is now it's it's not a display window anymore it's actually the window of the Marks and Spencer's cafe so I sat there uh, I sat there the other day eating uh, a melon medley little bowl <laughs> Of, of a little bowl of melons, uh, uh, just looking out uh, and uh, getting getting to know Ealing because of because of Doctor Who. The next episode that we're due to record is the Sontaran strategy on the Poison Sky and the invasion. And to, uh, to coincide with that, I think my first Doctor's Guide to London will be um, uh, a, a, an in, the invasion special. Oh, great! So Sorry. we'll put that up on the website. But yeah, uh, just uh, it's a little thing to end on. Anyway, uh, right, okay. Uh, I'll let you go. What, the listeners or me? <laughs> All of you. I've, I've, I don't know. <clears throat> I, feel like I've, I feel like I've held you hostage and just gabbed at you for uh, that little bit. Not at all, not at all. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, like I say, um, on the timelash.wordpress.com uh, and uh, we will speak to you next time. Enjoy, nice. enjoy Series 9. Yeah. Bye. Bye.